you know, in that book, there's a segment where the congressman talks about how there was, uh, during the March on Washington, um, some of his contemporaries tried to encourage him to kind of stand a little closer to the front and be a little more visible, and how he would just always talk about, and, and in this particular moment, he talked about how, well, you know, I'm, I'm not much for the limelight, and I'm short and stocky, and I'm not the most handsome guy. And, um, you know, all these things that I think, you know, many of pe people like me, I, I know that to be the attitude of a lot of my older relatives, people who have um, kind of gone through unimaginable things and who kind of come from a different generation. But I think what it reflects about the congressman and why he was so impactful to so many people is because there was an everyman quality about him um, that really jumped off the page and that I think um, inspired so many. You, you didn't have to be uh, six foot five and, you know, kind of cut from central casting. You could be just a boy from Troy, Alabama, and you could change the world. Yeah, I think that's a great point. Um, can we talk about some of his more recent um, accomplishments? Um, Nancy Cordes brought up the African American H History Museum and how he sort of brought that fight to the floor of Congress over and over and over again until he finally got it done. Absolutely. You know, there, there's so much that he was able to get done in his later years. You talk about the African American History Museum. The, the processional that we're watching right now, they just went past the MLK Memorial, I believe it is, um, in Washington, D.C. I think they're heading past the, the, the museum now. But I think it was so important to someone like Congressman Lewis to make sure that all of the fights that were fought were recorded and were chronicled um, and were there for generations to learn from. Um, and, um, you know, I think now with the, the rod that we're watching today and all of the memorials that we're seeing, you know, he joins the ages. He joins that long story that he helped tell for so many years. He now belongs to the ages. And I, I think that's a, a, a really um, impactful full circle moment that, um, that we're watching um, with, with he and his public profile now. Mm -hmm. And, you know, throughout his entire public career, um, one of the things that he continued to fight for uh, were voter, voting rights. Um, and, you know, in the, in the past few years, we've certainly seen some of that slip away, particularly with the Supreme Court decision that kind of took the teeth away from voting rights legislation. Um, it's easy to become um, disappointed in the turn of events. He was somebody who always sort of encouraged those to be optimistic, even when it seemed like some of the hard fought battles were being reversed. Yeah, I think I think that's right. I also think just to the point of your previous question though about why he fought mm -hmm. so hard to get that museum built, it's because it's important to know your history and to make sure that we use the platforms that we have to educate people about what happened and not allow history to be rewritten. You know, we're in an era right now where there's a lot of fight about, you know, fake news and this and that, and about whether the stories are being told accurately. And, um, you know, again, I don't, I don't mean to take a cheap political shot in a moment like this, but I do think that someone with the substance of Congressman Lewis um, really believed in telling the full accurate story as it happened. One, for the integrity of the story and because of the, the morality that he represented, but also to make sure that we don't repeat the mistakes of the past and that all of the battles that he fought and he was on the front lines of weren't fought in vain. Yeah. Yeah, very true. And when you look at some of the um, freshmen uh, congressmen and women um, that are perhaps uh, on the leading edge of the more progressive politics in Congress. Um, you know, they've to OAC, for example, has talked about the influence that sh that his um, his activities ha have had on her, her drive to get into politics, her view of the world. Um, I don't know if you could talk a little bit about, even though you know he's much much older than many of these young uh, congressmen and women. Uh, many of them really, really looked up to him and looked to him as an example. Well, you have to imagine that the fact that so much of his legacy was burnished um, when he was a very young man. I mean, the audio that you, you just played um, is from when he was in his mid-20s. He was 23 at the March yeah. on Washington, 25 in 1965, oh, yeah. crossing the bridge in Selma. So there has to be some kinship with these young firebrands, the people like the AOCs and the Ilhan Omars and, um, you know, some of those young dynamic leaders, the people on the front lines of Black Lives Matter, 
there's a kinship that they see in him because they know that he knows what it's like to be a young activist um, who's misunderstood, but also that he sees in them. He understands what the experience is to be young and to be inspired. There's, um, you know, he he studied at American uh, the Theological Seminary in Nashville um, in the early 60s. And while he was doing that, while he was getting his degree there, he was desegregating lunch counters in Nashville when he was 21 years old. I mean, that, that, that's a, that is a lifetimes of work um, before he could, you know, I'm not, I, I can't remember when, when the drinking age was at the time, but probably before he could drink or, uh, you know, maybe even drive, he was, he was changing his community. And so there's a commonality to that experience that I think a lot of younger um, policymakers and younger activists and people who have gotten involved, they, they probably experience that kinship with his experience. Indeed. Um, so just to remind people what we're watching, this hearse is carrying the body of uh, John Lewis through the nation's capital, stopping at places of significance for him. It's part of a uh, long procession that began over the weekend. And if you caught any of the coverage, you may have seen um, the casket go across the Edmund Pettus Bridge in Selma, Alabama. Um, the congressman was beaten, uh, as you point out, um, to within in an inch of his life, having a cracked skull when he participated in a demonstration there along with 600 other activists. And then, many, many years later, he spoke. So we want to play some of that sound for you. This is sound, uh, audio from a speech that John Lewis gave. Uh, wait a minute, let me make sure I got the right one. All right, during the walk from Selma to Montgomery, nope. This is 50 years after that walk. There you go. 50 years after the events of Bloody Sunday, um, and this is what he had to say. My beloved brothers and sisters, members of the American family on this day, we as a nation have a great deal to be thankful for. Jimmy Lee Jackson. Jimmy Lee Jackson whose death inspired the Selma March, along with so many others, did not make to see this day. But you and I are here. We can bear witness to the distance we have come and the progress we have made in 50 years, and we must use this moment to recommit ourselves to do all we can to finish the work that still work left to be done. Get out there and push and pull until we redeem the soul of America. Now I want to thank President Barack Obama and Mrs. Obama, President George Bush and Mrs. Bush for being here today. I want to thank all the members of the cabinet and the administration who are here, my colleagues in the Congress, all the elected officials, including the great governor, Robert Bentley, including the mayor of Selma, George Evans, and all other American people. I would like for all members of the Congress in our delegation just to stand. Thank you. I want to thank the Faith and Politics Institute for bringing us together one more time. And the co-leaders of our delegation, Senator Tim Scott, Senator Sherry Brown, Representative Terry Sewell, and Representative Martha Roby, thank you so much. It is good to see Mrs. Boynton, who was our first contact when we came to Selma, in 1962. She was registering people to vote here long before we arrived. Also glad to see the daughter of Governor George Wallace here, Peggy Wallace Kennedy. Thank you for being here, Peggy. (laughs) 
And I want to thank each and every one of you who marched across the bridge on Bloody Sunday. You didn't have to do it, but you did it. Thank you. I tell you, it's good to be in Selma one more time, just one more time. People often ask me, why do you come back? What purpose does it serve? We come to Selma to be renewed. We come to be inspired. We come to be reminded that we must do the work that justice and equality calls us to do. On March 7, 1965, a few innocent children of God, some carrying only a bed roll, a few clutching a simple bag, a plain purse or a backpack, were inspired to walk 50 dangerous miles from Selma to Montgomery to demonstrate the need for voting rights in the state of Alabama. On that day, on that day, 600 people marched into history, walking two by two down the sidewalk, not interfering with the free floor trade and commerce, not interfering with traffic, with a kind of military discipline. We were so peaceful, so quiet, no one saying a word. We were beaten, tear gas. Some of us was left bloody right here on this bridge. 17 of us were hospitalized that day. But we never became bitter or hostile. We kept believing that the truth we stood for would have the final say. This city, on the banks of the Alabama River, gave birth to a movement that changed this nation forever. Our country will never, ever be the same because of what happened on this bridge. Eight days after Bloody Sunday, the President of the United States, Lyndon Bain Johnson, delivered one of the most meaningful speeches ever made by any president on the question of voting rights. He said, the time of justice has come. I believe sincerely that no force can hold it back. He went on to say, it is right in the eyes of man and God that it should come. He said, at times, history and fate meet at a single time in a single place to shape a turning point in man unending search for freedom. He went on to say, so it was at Lexington and Concord, so it was at Appomattox, so it was in Selma, Alabama, each of us must go back to our homes after this celebration and build on the legacy of the march of 1965. The Selma movement is saying today that we all can do something. So I said to you, don't give up on the things that have great meaning to you. Don't get lost in a sea of despair. Stand up for what you believe. Because in a final analysis, we are one people, one family, the human family. We all live in the same house, the American house, the world house. We're black, we're white, we are Hispanic, Asian American, Native American, but we're one people. Thank you.
So you have just been listening to Congressman John Lewis speaking 50 years after Bloody Sunday, uh, the Sunday when he crossed the bridge with 600, 600 other activists and w w was beaten by police um, and, and arrested. 50 years later, he went there as a congressman um, surrounded by supporters. And then just this weekend, his casket crossed that bridge. And instead of, uh, you know, sort of in this poetic crossing, it, it would there were officers on the other side greeting um, his casket, saluting his casket. Um, what we're watching here is video of the hearse traveling through um, Washington, D.C. My monitor's quite small here right now, but it appears as if he's at the Black Lives Matter um, Memorial, I believe that's what it might be at. Um, the hearse is stopping at various places, the Black Lives Matter Memorial, one of them, the history of uh, the Museum of African American History, another one, Martin Luther King Jr. Memorial, another one. Uh, with me is Joel Payne, who's been with us um, all morning long. And uh, Lana Zach is also joining us uh, as well. Um, to talk about sort of this great man and and the great loss and and moving forward, I want to ask you. Um, I was going to ask actually, I, though I see Lana's there. Hello, Lana. I was going to ask. Hi, Anne Marie. Hi, Joel. Um, hi. Uh, you know, the congressman, as we talked earlier, he you know announced that he had cancer and um, you know went off to fight that that battle, you know, the battle of his life, obviously, and was not able to participate in the wave of uh, protest and activism that we've seen um, over the past six months or so. But uh, if he had been able to participate, um, you know, what do you think his message would have been to the activists that we're seeing today? Uh, not, not to be argumentative, Anne-Marie, but I, I, I think he did participate. Um, and you know we we see that we see his his hearse is now uh, kind of gracing uh, the the area where that was made very famous and frankly infamous uh, for for some of the things that happened earlier this summer related to the George Floyd protest. Um, I think that you know him going to spend some reflective time there um, really blessed that area and blessed that ground that. So many people, so much foot traffic is going to walk through, and you see what it's staring right at. It's staring right at the White House. Um, but I, I think spiritually, John Lewis was there, and he made it very, very clear that he was with all those who were protesting in spirit. Um, he put out a statement that talked about how he saw um, alliance with the folks who were out there in the streets. He did encourage them to be constructive and not destructive. But they knew that he had his back and that he was supporting the work that they were doing to rebuild their communities and to change the world the same way that he did some 50 years ago. So um, I, I understand your point that he physically has not been able to participate, but I think he was there. And I think that the folks who it mattered to on the ground, I think they knew um, he was there with him. And yeah, if I, I can think, jump I in as well, guys. At this point. Mm -hmm. uh, it, it is. It is. Um, it is worth noting that uh, as the processional um, makes its way along uh, Black Lives Matter. Uh, Boulevard um, facing the White House there, that that was, in fact, one of his, I think, probably his last actual public appearance coming out with uh, D.C. Mayor Muriel Bowser and, and viewing that space. Um, and I, I remember seeing those images of him there and how powerful that was, even if, uh, even if in that moment he didn't have that same soaring oratories that we've come to expect from the congressman, but just his, his physical presence there was uh, was inspirational. I think also, just really quickly, um, I, I think not insignificant part of this procession is happening right now, which is the casket going past the White House, which is, again, it's, mm. it's, it's attached um, to uh, the plaza. The, the plaza leads into um, to H Street here in D.C., which folks know is where Lafayette Park um, faces kind of the backside of the White House. They, they have the fences up there that are, you know, probably uh, 25, 30 yards from where you previously in the past uh, could have kind of gotten that close to the White House. But now his casket is going down H Street. And, um, you know, I think the fact that that casket is going past the White House, um, I'm sure that that's not incidental. 
um, that the, the casket is making that journey as well as it's heading uh, towards the Capitol Rotunda, where, of course, the congressman will be the first black lawmaker to lie in the rotunda. Um, we had Elijah Cummings, who lied in state and statuary hall, but Congressman Lewis will be the first um, black lawmaker to lie in the Capitol Rotunda, a, uh, an honor that he certainly deserves. Yeah, you know, we heard him. Um, thing to point out. Go ahead, Lon. We heard in that that speech that you were playing just before Anne Marie um, on the Edmund Pettus Bridge, and, and remembering that time. And he said, "We came, we come to be inspired." And listening to you and Joel um, speaking about the late congressman, it's hard not to feel inspired today. As he as he talked about uh, 17 people being hospitalized in that moment, um, but that they never became bitter. And Anne Marie, you said um, he he lost his he lost lost his sense of fear, all sense of fear after that. But I think part of what made him so extraordinary is that he never lost his sense of hope. You would expect someone who went through the things, uh, who experienced um, the raw hostility, the racism, the physical violence uh, that he did, to to be a more angry, more bitter, more, uh, more hardened against the world. But, you know, as a student, he studied philosophy and religion, and I think that that was part of his core us, his core self, that he was always hopeful and optimistic and, and told everybody else never to lose that sense of hope and, and always viewed uh, civic participation, voting as the most powerful tools towards nonviolence, towards progress. Um, and I think that that's part of what everybody is taking in right now as, as we see his, um, his casket making its way through all these important parts of Washington, D.C. And as Joel said, even facing off physically uh, with the White House, um, symbolically, I guess, in that moment, with uh, President Trump, who he had uh, had decided to boycott his inauguration, the second time that he had decided to boycott a presidential inauguration. But the way that he always stood up against injustice or, and things that he found to be um, lacking in our society, but still doing it with the willingness to to see people make change and to embrace them when they did. Mm -hmm. Yeah, Alana, I think that those are all um, great things to point out, particularly his insistence that people remain optimistic and hopeful. I, I suppose that you couldn't keep up this fight for decades upon decades if you couldn't stay optimistic that um, there would be lasting and permanent change. Um, and I think, you know, particularly when we focus in on voting rights, I imagine for him it must have been an exhausting fight because there is legislation now that he has put forward that he has pushed uh, to protect the rights of voters uh, that has still to be taken up by Congress. I mean, what's what where his fight began, it sort of has continued even sort of after him. Yeah, and we see we see the casket now moving past the um, the African American History Museum on the National Mall. Uh, so I just want to point that out to our viewers how influential he was in making that happen. Uh, and you can see the Washington Monument standing side by side. What an what an extraordinary contrast uh, and and revealing about American history and the progress that um, Congressman Lewis and so many other help helped our nation to achieve and the the work that we all still have to do. Joel, I think I heard you sort of wanting to jump in there. No, I, I think you think you guys have um, have summarized the moment well. And, um, you know, I would just point out about that African-American um, Museum of History. It is probably one of the more transformative experiences you could have to uh, to, to spend spend some time. It'll take you some time because there's a lot to take in. But to spend some time there in Washington, D.C. and, you know, it's 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 overwhelming to you know somebody who was much younger than when a lot of the fights that were fought that are chronicled in that museum. It, it's a lot to take in as an observer. Um, John Lewis lived it. <laughs> His life, you know, intersected with many of the moments that are chronicled in that building, um, and and so um, I think it just gives you a small sense of his experience and what the world was like from his vantage point. Um, and I think that's probably why it was such a an important um, milestone for him to get that building up 
and to be a part of the group. Many others, Lonnie Birch, who is the chair of that museum now, but be a part of that group um, that really made sure that that building was there. It was in proximity to the Washington Monument. It's also in very close proximity to the White House. It is a part of the fabric of that downtown federal district part of Washington, D.C., that um, I think will be forever changed because of uh, its existence there. You know, we're talking about him um, in regards to his like, sort of place in history, but he was also, you know, a congressman for Georgia. And I'm, I'm wondering if you could speak to what it, he meant for the people of that state. Well, I'll, I'll start, you know, what you have to understand about Atlanta, and, you know, look, I, I, I hesitate to bring up the fights that he's had with President Trump, because I think that takes away from the moment. And, and, and certainly, I don't, I don't want to make this about some later fights he had in life with Donald Trump. But I'll bring this up just for context. Um, you know, the president, I think, uh, early in his term, I believe it was 2017, John Lewis had uh, spoken truth to power about Donald Trump, and Donald Trump responded by, you know, claiming that his district in Atlanta was broken and beaten down and that it had been, you know, it was burned out and basically saying all these terrible things, which just couldn't be further from the truth. Um, you know, uh, Congressman Lewis district in Atlanta and the area he represents in Atlanta, it's one of the monuments to black achievement, black education, black wealth. Um, they're very proud of um, the, the black legacy that's been built there. Um, and it's a, it's a legacy that Congressman Lewis had a lot to do with. Um, so to suggest that one is untrue, but also just kind of spits in the face of the legacy that so many others, not just Congressman Lewis, but so many others have worked uh, to build in that community of Atlanta. People like former mayor, former ambassador Andrew Young, C.T. Vivian, who we lost last week, um, you know, Martin Luther King and his family. There, there's so much legacy of black achievement, black excellence, black wealth in that area um, that John Lewis was certainly appropriate to represent. Mm -hmm. um, so just to remind everyone what we're watching, um, this is the body of Congressman uh, John Lewis um, traveling to um, through our nation's capital. He will lie in state in the Capitol Rotunda. Um, there are restrictions in place because of the COVID-19 pandemic. Um, only a small number of people um, will be permitted inside the rotunda, a small uh, number of members of Congress and, and staff, I think just about 80, whereas the rotunda can um, hold some uh, 300 people or so. Uh, members of the general public, though, who want to pay their respects will be permitted to do so during designated times outside, um, between uh, 6 p.m. and 10 p.m. today, and then 8 a.m. and 10 p.m. tomorrow. But um, as you pointed out, Joel, there have been people sort of lining the route um, where the Hearst is traveling, trying to take pictures, um, trying to sort of just be a part of this moment. I mean, normally, any other time, if we're living any other time, I'm sure this route would have been packed with people. Uh, you know, so it's just so, I mean, it's, it's, it's a little disappointing that this is the send off that he's going to get because he deserves so much more. But, you know, his legacy continues to echo. We, we see um, the lessons of his legacy pretty much every day when we look at uh, the people uh, taking to the streets um, across the country. Um, this is part of a, uh, I think, perhaps a two week long um, sort of memorial for him. He will ultimately be um, laid to rest um, back in, um, I believe, in Georgia. Um, but for now, it's our nation's capital that he is, where many of the people who worked alongside him will have an opportunity to say goodbye. Um, Joel, you are with me, but I also want to point out to everyone that uh, Lana Zak is also with me um, as we are covering this live for you. We are awaiting a CBS News special report, um, perhaps which uh, may begin, I think, once um, the casket arrives at the Capitol building. Um, but that's what we're witnessing right now. Absolutely. And we have been talking to we have been talking about the congressman, his legacy, and also listening to, um, you know, his words from 1965, 1963. I mean, it feels like a generation ago, and it really was. The congressman came out of a time that seems so radically different than um, what we're living today, yet there are so many um, recurring 
themes, lessons, and issues. Um, and I think perhaps the biggest one has to do with the rights of voters. And that's a fight that, you know, John Lewis has sort of fought for his entire career, Joel. Absolutely. And, and, and look, I think it's also so important to not sanitize history um, in moments like this. And, you know, uh, Amory, we talked about this a, a bit earlier, but I think John Lewis had the gift of years to be able to grow into this figure that I think became lauded and loved and beloved. Um, many of his contemporaries did not have that gift. But the, the congressman um, has a legacy that has to be told in full. And it has to be told about the time when the public wasn't on his side and when he was fighting a fight that he didn't have a lot of friends and allies, um, you know, in the white community. I think it's important that that is told and that we don't try to sanitize him into a kind of sterile, um, you know, figure that really lacks the depth and the full breadth of experience that the congressman does. Um, I would imagine that that would not be a, a part of his legacy he would appreciate. I think he would appreciate the full story being told, um, good, bad, and ugly. Um, the times when maybe um, he did not feel quite as welcome um, in establishment society as he did at the end of his life. Um, I think that's why, again, to the point about making sure history is told accurately, I think that that was why that was such an important part of some of his later work was to make sure that things were chronicled and recorded, is because the real, unsanitized, unvarnished version of history is told. Um, yeah, I think... Um, uh I, you know, Joel, I, I really appreciate those comments because it's so, it seems so fitting and, and easy to, uh, to, to Saint uh, Representative Lewis because he really was a, a um, he represented our better angels. But uh, there's a quote that, that I'll read for our viewers about him uh, that he said, I don't have any extraordinary gifts. I'm just an average Joe who grew up in very, very poor in rural Alabama. And he, he always felt that he was just a regular guy who felt compelled uh, to do his part in history. And so um, our history as a nation, really ugly. And there's a lot of stuff that we are still trying to, to, um, to pull apart and, and figure out. Um, but there is something that is, that is tru truly remarkable about a person who felt like I'm not extraordinary. I am just a person who's willing to act, and uh, and how that can inspire all of us uh, to try and look history uh, square in the face, look our 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 future and our present square in the face, and try and ask how we can help contribute in in memory of Lewis and so many others who have worked so hard um, to do more and and to be more as as we really look critically at where we are as a nation. Absolutely. You know, I, I shared a story earlier, Lana, about um, I had an opportunity to meet the congressman and actually work with him um, through some work on the Hillary Clinton campaign in 2016. And you talk about he seeing himself as an average Joe. Um, and of course, to someone like me, I, you know, I, I, I said earlier, I looked at him like he had five heads when he, he asked me, um, you know, <laughs> if he did a good job reading the script that I wrote. And I, yeah, I just said, what, you know, I, I was befuddled. Like, what, what? I just, I, I listened to Manna from Heaven uh, that you just read, but he did not view himself in that way. I'm sure he understood the importance and the impact of the work that he was doing, but I think that part of why he's so relatable and why we are taking so much time to accurately eulogize him is because he presented himself as an everyman and he presented himself as an average Joe, uh, but by no means was anything that this man accomplished in his life average or ordinary. This is a CBS News special report. I'm Nora O'Donnell in Washington, D.C., and we are coming on the air to observe a solemn moment in our nation's history. The man known as the conscience of Congress is arriving at the Capitol for the final time, following two days of tributes in Alabama. The hearse carrying the casket of Congressman John Lewis, a lion of the civil rights movement, arriving after a procession through the streets of Washington. And it was quite moving to see the motorcade made several stops at several notable landmarks 
first the Martin Luther King Memorial on the National Mall. Lewis was, after all, a young protege of Dr. King. They met when Lewis was just 18 years old. We then watched as the motorcade stopped at the Black Lives Matter Plaza near the White House, which Lewis visited just June 7th. And to see that then, there were so many crowds there just a short time ago. It was incredible to see that. And then, of course, the National Museum of African American History and Culture, also on the Mall, which only exists because Lewis spent 15 years reintroducing the bill to establish it. John Lewis represented Georgia for more than 30 years, and he died on July 17th at the age of 80 after battling pancreatic cancer. Now, John Lewis will lie in state at the Capitol Rotunda, an honor afforded to just a few dozen people in American history. Joining us now is award-winning director Ava DuVernay. She met John Lewis while directing the film Selma, based on the voting rights marches in 1965. Ava, means so much to have you here on this day. Uh, incredible to not only uh, watch uh, this great respect paid to this man, but uh, I know you're tearing up, but also to look back. Uh, we watched my family, we watched Good Trouble last night, and of course we love your movie, Selma too. Your thoughts on this day? What a triumph. You know, what a, what a life well done, well done. Um, as you were just giving the introduction, I was okay. And then I just uh, thought about, I just thought about what a great person and what a triumphant life. Uh, these are happy tears because I know that John Lewis always said that day on the bridge in Selma, he, he thought he would die that day. And uh, he, he told me that story in, in great detail. And uh, to think that he lived to be 80 years old and all the accomplishments and just all the blessings that he's given this country, um, a country that did not, did not always uh, treat him the same way. And so, uh, so generous in spirit, one-on-one, um, but then also just a giant triumphant life. Um, you know, I know when he was on the bridge in Soma that, that day, he would have never thought this. Look at what's happening. And so mm -hmm. um, it's just a testament to the spirit of, of of a man who was born out of a movement that um, still reverberates to this day. You know, the fact that he was so connected to the Black Lives Matter movement that he was proud of, uh, of that continuation of, of, of uh, activism, um, that he didn't separate himself from it. Um, it's just, it's just um, very telling. And uh, he, he was just a, a extremely a singular American icon who I'll personally miss very much. What did he tell you when you were making the movie Selma? He told me everything. <laughs> he told me everything <laughs> in so much detail. We would sit and he answered every question. He was very, um, very open to the questions, very open to the things that I wanted to know about. Um, some questions I'd ask, he said, let me, let me, that's way back there. Let me try to jog my memory, get that back. Sometimes he'd say, I need a day to remember that one. That, that, I haven't thought about that part too often. Uh, but the spirit of his answers were always uh, very communal. He, he didn't just want to talk about himself. He wanted to talk about everyone who was involved, everyone, the local leaders on the ground there who had invited him and, and other folks from different parts of the country into Selma. Um, you know, but his legacy went far beyond Selma. He would talk to me about Georgia, his love for his state. Uh, he would talk to me about Troy, Alabama, because uh, he's really just a boy from Troy. I always had to get Troy into the conversation. Mm -hmm. um, and, uh, and, you know, one memory that I'll just share is that uh, in the, uh, we had, a, I had the occasion to go to uh, Washington, D.C. to share Selma at uh, President Obama's White House. And uh, Congressman Lewis was with us, obviously. And uh, he took such a, uh, a beautiful uh, moment, several beautiful moments to connect with my father, who's since passed away. Because uh, my father was from Lowndes County, Alabama. And so I'd look over and they'd be in the corner talking about Alabama, uh, <laughs> even though we're in the White House. Um, you know, so just a, a really uh, beautiful man. You know, Ava, I was struck by certainly the, 
the images in 1965 and the beginning of the march and the Alabama state troopers who told them to stop and then, of course, used their batons to attack and to break the skull of John Lewis. And yesterday, in that final procession, Alabama state troopers stood there and saluted his casket. Yeah. That's change. Yes. Well, that, that was a, 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 a jaw dropper uh, for, for me to watch. Um, mm -hmm. You know, and it really just speaks to, I texted my sister, who's the uh, 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 director of Memorial and Museum Relations at the Equal Justice Initiative, EJI, which is just down the street from the Montgomery Capitol, where we shot the end of Selma and where Dr. King uh, and the whole, um, uh, cadre of, of, of leaders ended their march uh, from Selma to Montgomery. And um, to see that salute made me believe in, in its most tangible sense that nothing is impossible, that, um, that where we are now is not where uh, we will be in the end. That um, that even if you can't see the, the 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 end of the road, that there is a destination ahead that is going to be different than where you are now, and uh, to think about and look at that footage and see those troopers knock John Lewis and uh, and and Amelia Boynton uh, straight over with batons, and then to see them carefully lift the same. This is this is the same group of people, the same agency, these years later, uh, gently uh, carrying his body. Um, you know, if, if you can't watch that and believe that uh, there's something important, even in the symbolism of that, even though we know the deep divide and the deep uh, challenges that we're having in Alabama, uh, that alone symbolically uh, is something that I think had great import and, um, and signals us in a direction of, of growth and change that I think is important to embrace. We're seeing his hearse arrive now on the east front of the Capitol, the conscience of the Congress, who, even after the Pulse nightclub shooting in Florida, let us sit in, you know, for more than 24 hours. He continued through his entire life uh, that nonviolent resistance of pushing constantly for change in the way that he did. And, um, his legacy lives on so much. And I, I want to ask you, too, just about where you think it goes from here. What are the steps still that need to be taken, the Black Lives Matter movement that, in some ways, he helped birth and represents so beautifully? Well, you know, we, the, the Voting Rights Act must be restored. Uh, you know, there, there are no protections for people and their right to vote. We see the uh, devastating consequences of that, you know, and in places like Georgia already with disastrous um, uh, an election process uh, early on this year. Uh, we can only expect that con to continue. We can't just tell people to vote. The congressman knew this. At this point, it's about defending the right to vote. And so, you know, in so many ways, we've slid back. Um, but I believe, as the congressman did and as the congressman taught me, believe in the power of people. People can create the change. And so if people decide um, that they want things to be different as it relates to our right to vote, that that right should not be something that you have to pay for, have to fight for, have to die for, um, then things will change. And that's how um, it changed in Selma. Um, uh, congressman Lewis and, and many others demonstrated um, the danger that they had to face in order uh, to gain the right to vote. And so that is what um, is happening now in the Black Lives Matter movement. Um, it's a shame that we have to continue to share examples of our personhood and our citizenship, um, but we will continue to do that until, until these, these rights are gained fully. Um, so the, the easy answer, there's many answers to the question, but the Voting Rights Act is top of mind, especially this year. Jim Clyburn saying just today, Congressman Clyburn saying we should dedicate this election year to John Lewis and certainly as everyone needs to exercise their right to vote and be concerned that no voters feel disenfranchised. Ava DuVernay, thank you. Thank you so much. Thank you. Thank you for thank you we're for grateful to have you. We appreciate it. And um we want to bring in Chief Congressional Correspondent Nancy Cordes because she is there on Capitol Hill just now as 
John Lewis arrives for this final time and so that people can pay their respects to him. Nancy? Nora, it's very quiet, very solemn here on the East Plaza of the U.S. Capitol. The hearse just pulled up behind us a couple of moments ago, and you can see to the right of the hearse, a military honor guard waiting. They will be the ones to take the casket out of the hearse and carry it up the east steps of the U.S. Capitol. You'll notice that they themselves are all wearing masks. Off to the left of the, the hearse, a small group of lawmakers, other well-wishers have gathered in a, a fenced-off area. I can see a Congressman Fred Upton of Michigan, Congresswoman Sylvia Garcia of Texas, others waiting to greet the body as it arrives. And then up at the top of the steps, the sergeant at arms of the U.S. House, he will direct the casket into the U.S. Capitol where it will be brought to the rotunda for an arrival ceremony. Uh, because we are in the midst of a pandemic, Nora, this uh, honor is going to look a lot different than it has in the recent past when individuals like John McCain and Elijah Cummings and George H.W. Bush have uh, received the same honor lying in state. Instead, after this arrival ceremony, after dignitaries, lawmakers, loved ones have had an opportunity to pay their respects, the casket will be brought back out here to the east front of the Capitol. It will be placed at the top of the steps, and then members of the public will be allowed in a socially distant fashion to walk along the bottom of the steps to pay their respects and say goodbye. Um, because after all, that is what this ceremony is all about. That's the entire reason that uh, we, we have this procedure of, of honoring people who lie in state. It's so the public can say goodbye to individuals who have made an extraordinary impact on this nation. And this is the way uh, that, that the organizers, officials here on Capitol Hill have determined it is the safest way for the public to be able to pay tribute, deliver that send off while staying safe. And we watch now as the family enters the United States Capitol. This is the east front of the Capitol, which in its historical significance is also where you see Marine One land when a president leaves office. Most recently, uh, when Barack Obama left office, they leave from the east front of the Capitol. You see the honor guard there getting ready, as Nancy mentioned, uh, to bring John Lewis's casket into the U.S. rotunda as John Lewis becomes the first black lawmaker in U.S. history to lie in state in the Capitol rotunda. Congressman Elijah Cummings did lie in state in Statuary Hall previously, but this is the first time in the rotunda, a remarkable honor for the civil rights icon. And Perhaps, Nancy, preview for us what we're going to see in this ceremony ahead uh, that's coming up soon. Absolutely, Nora. So the House Speaker Nancy Pelosi will have some opening remarks. She was a very close friend of John Lewis's. They served together in Congress for 33 years. She's been very open about uh, the depth of their friendship. We'll also hear from Mitch McConnell, the majority leader of the U.S. Senate. We're going to hear some of John Lewis's own words will be played, a recording uh, of some of his thoughts, and that will be, uh, I'm sure, quite moving. Uh, we'll also see the traditional laying of wreaths upon the casket, and then we'll also hear a benediction from another one of John Lewis's very close friends, the majority whip, James Clyburn, a congressman of, uh, of, of South Carolina, who, um, you know, ha has spoken so movingly about his relationship with, um, with John Lewis over these many decades, even before they both came to Capitol Hill. Um, this cer ceremony is by necessity going to look a lot different than ceremonies that we've seen inside the Capitol in these instances. The chairs will have to be placed farther apart uh, to create the proper social distancing. People will be wearing masks, and that means that there isn't enough room for all the lawmakers and dignitaries who would normally want to be in the rotunda 
for an event like this to mark history. There will be more seats placed in Statuary Hall uh, and others, uh, as, as you can see, have been gathered just here on the uh, east front of the Capitol uh, because there won't be room for all of them. Another thing that's different, Nora, I should point out from, uh, from the typical uh, scene that we observe when we've seen other individuals lie in state is that we don't see as many members of the public here gathered along the fences as we have in the past. And certainly there's a small crowd that has begun to form, but Beyond uh, the, the, the pandemic and, and John Lewis's family expressly urging people who aren't from D.C. not to travel here for this event, it's also one of the hottest days of the summer, 93 degrees right now, heat index above 100, a dangerous time for some people to be outside, of, particularly for a long period of time, and that's probably keeping some people away as well. And there you see good trouble on the mask of Congresswoman Karen Bass there. The phrase that uh, the name of one of John Lewis's book, of course, and the phrase that he used to describe the nonviolent resistance and protest that he embodied throughout his lifetime. I want to bring in New York Times columnist and CBS News political analyst Jamel Bowie, who joins us from Charlottesville, Virginia. And uh, Jamel, I know you've written that that it takes people like John Lewis to make a democracy. He's changed so much in his lifetime, changed the course of history. That's right. Without Lewis, without the actions of the people on that bridge in 1965, there wouldn't be a Voting Rights Act. And the Voting Rights Act really should be understood as one of the seminal pieces of legislation, I think, in American history. It enfranchises African Americans in the South. It creates sort of the closest thing to a presumption that every American uh, has the right to vote that we've ever had. And, you know, after its passage in 65, in the next several years, you see an explosion, not just of African American voting, but of African American lawmakers running for office, holding office, all across the political system from, you know, sheriff all the way to legisl uh, congressperson. And so that, you know, if, if Lewis's legacy was only the Voting Rights Act, I think he would rank as one of the most uh, influential Americans uh, in this country's history. The timeline, of course, as you note, the March in Selma, I believe, in March, and then, of course, signed into law in August by President LBJ, you know, less than a year. Um, and when LBJ said uh, the crippling legacy of bigotry and justice, injustice rather, must end, they had met with, um, including Martin Luther King Jr., they had met with President LBJ and tried to push this, and yet it was those, that bloody Sunday in Selma and those images that helped in some ways propel Congress and this president to finally act, the past Congress and pre the president to act, correct? That's right. I, I think the story of the Voting Rights Act and really the story of the civil rights movement as a whole is an illustration of something that's been very true throughout American history, which is that it takes ordinary citizens doing uh, actions on the ground, protests, uh, uh, sort of organizing to push the political system in the direction of uh, more justice, more freedom, more liberty. These things simply do not happen. It simply does not unfold in that direction. It really does take um, the actions of again, ordinary citizens. This is something that I, I don't think can be stressed enough. Uh, the people who marched in Selma, the people who are part of the civil rights movement, the people who would take uh, inspiration from the civil rights movement in, over the next several decades to fight for LGBT rights, for women's rights, for the rights of the disabled, these are all ordinary people. Um, the, no, these are all people doing um, uh, things for which they not, don't necessarily have training, uh, experience, but they are putting their bodies on the line for the sake of uh, this country's democratic principles. And Lewis's life, I think, if, if it does anything, should remind us that uh, realizing democracy, making democracy real for everyone, takes that kind of commitment. The commitment, 15 years in the making to get the African American History Museum on the National Mall. Um, you know, the dogged persistence on so many legislative acts that he pushed through in Congress, working side by side, and in some cases in a bipartisan manner as well. Um, I also think about, too, as you mentioned, the Voting Rights Act. Uh, Congressman Lewis's description when Barack Obama was elected President of the United States and in the ceremony afterwards he went up to 
President Obama with his program and asked him to sign it, and President Obama signed it because of you, John. And then four years later, at the next inauguration, President Obama signed it again and said, it's still because of you, John. Barack Obama giving credit to John Lewis for his ability to run for and become president of the United States. That's right. And the one thing I would, I would say about that is for, for all the attention we are giving to John Lewis, we have to also always remember that he was part of a movement. That, and I think uh, Congressman Lewis, when he was alive, would have said much the same thing, that um, these things happen because people working together in community, people organizing together, people working um, in tandem, that this the, the work of improving American democracy isn't the work of singular individuals, but it's the work of Americans acting together as communities, um, as people organizing together to push forward. And as we are looking uh, in the present, you know, earlier you drew a connection between Congressman Lewis and Black Lives Matter. I think as we look in the present, we should be looking to those communities, to those groupings, to, those or, to that organizing, to see and to try to understand um, how they are working in tandem to move their interests forward and move the democracy forward. It's an excellent point. Jamal Bowie, thank you. I want to bring in CBS News political correspondent Ed O'Keefe. He is at the National Museum of African American history and, and culture. And, and Ed, I have to ask you, what was it like uh, when the procession drove by just a short time ago? I was struck, Nora, you know, at, at midday, early afternoon on a Monday in July, there would be hundreds, if not thousands, of people out here on the mall, tourists, uh, you know, parents with children, people who work in the federal buildings nearby, perhaps on their lunch break. And we stood at the corner of 14th and Constitution just a little while ago as it went by, and there were maybe just two dozen people. Uh, a handful of them did come out of those federal buildings on their lunch break to pay respects. Others were simply tourists uh, who are here in town or locals who were out for a jog and suddenly saw the commotion and were told what it was about, and they just stopped to watch it. Uh, go by very quickly. It was a, an incredible and extraordinary farewell journey for the congressman, beginning, beginning of course, at Joint Base Andrews, stopping at the MLK Jr. Memorial, uh, a place, of course, that pays tribute to his mentor and friend, the Lincoln Memorial, and then up to Black Lives Matter Plaza, the newest memorial or monument in this town, paying tribute to the ongoing uh, struggle for civil rights uh, now in the 21st century, and the place where the congressman made his final public appearance to, in essence, bless the movement and bless the site, uh, or at least give it his seal of approval. Uh, the mayor of Washington handed a Black Lives Matter street sign to the son of the congressman before the motorcade continued on here to the museum and then on to the Justice Department, the uh, League of uh, uh, Women, the Women Negroes League, and, uh, and then the Supreme Court. Um, and I'm struck, Nora, the fact that there's nobody in the streets today, or very few people in the streets, uh, I think sort of clashes incredibly with the fact that if you were ever up on Capitol Hill, and you may have seen this when you were there back in the day, Nancy undoubtedly saw it as well, that if tourists happened to come upon him, inevitably somebody in the group understood who he was and reached out and shook his hand or asked for a photo. And he was one of maybe just two or three of the 535 people who serve up there that might have been recognizable sight on scene to most Americans who come there to pay a visit to the Capitol. So in many ways, a lot of people did already get to pay tribute to him when they saw him in action up on Capitol Hill as a congressman. I saw it several times. I'm sure you guys did as well. Uh, and we will see uh, what the crowds are like later today and into tomorrow when people are allowed to pay tribute under the blazing sun. It's an excellent point, Ed. And Congressman John Lewis revered by so many that if he was walking in an airport or down a street or in the halls of Congress, you know, there would normally be a crowd around him asking to take a picture, you know, such a, a giant, and not only um, in civil rights history, but in American history, that he would have many people, he would, it would be difficult for him to get the plane because so many people were asking for photographs or pictures or whatever it may be. Um, and a man who did it with such humility, held such grace, and was so well respected by so many of his colleagues. I want to bring in CBS This Morning Saturday co-host Michelle Miller. She has been in Alabama for the past several days covering that state's goodbye 
to um, Representative Lewis and um, Michelle, um, give us a recap of what it's been like the past couple days there in Alabama as part of these six days that America will pay tribute and say goodbye to John Lewis. Well, it started in his hometown of Troy, Alabama, and uh, I think about the service at Troy University on Saturday, recapping uh, the life and times of the boy from Troy from his siblings. Um, they talk about a young man who seemed to know where he was going, and where he was going was to make change. He, they knew it from the time that he would talk and preach to the chickens. Part of his chores for the family was to feed the chickens. And he had something to say then. So who else would be a captive audience but those that he would feed? It moved on to like his daring to, to be different and, and, and voice opposition to the segregation laws in the state by simply requesting a library card, they said, and being denied. Again, trying to apply to the university uh, in his hometown, and again, being ignored because of the color of his skin. And what's so interesting about that moment uh, at Troy University in that service is the president pointed out that two years ago, they gave him an honorary doctorate. So a full circle moment where the realization of the change in the state and the progress, we should say, that he helped to usher in. From there, being uh, so moved by what happened here in Montgomery, Alabama, uh, watching Rosa Parks and Martin Luther King in the Montgomery bus boycott, that it inspired him to write that preacher, as you once said, and then the invitation. This is where he learned and was trained the very beginning of his activism with Martin Luther King Jr. And so then being moved to go on to Fisk University in Nashville, Tennessee, and there receiving a true training in the nonviolent sit-ins and the training of making sure that you were prepared for what was coming at you, the, the being spat at, being attacked, you know, all of those things, can you imagine a, 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 a child or a teenager of, of, of this time, that happening to you now? And so I, I just have to say, even before Selma, you know, this man was tested, iron tested in this movement. And then, of course, as we keep mentioning Selma, Alabama, that walk across the Edmund Pettus Bridge and the ceremonies that that not only incorporated that moment, but took heart at what those people, those 600 people did. Uh, it's quite remarkable. And so many of them uh, were part of those celebrations, including the youngest marcher on that bridge, an eight-year-old girl back then in 1965 by the name of Cheyenne Webb Kreisberg. And she certainly was not, um, shall we say, she, she was not shielded from any of the attacks. The tear gas entered her eyes. She witnessed so much violence that it, she said it traumatized her for the rest of her life. And yet there again was Congressman John Lewis always offering her a hand each time, every year coming on the pilgrimage to Selma, to the Edmund Pettus Bridge to walk across it, and her always being included and always offering a hand. She said he got her through as a child all the way to today, through the trauma of, of that moment. Uh, and then you look at someone like Congresswoman Terry Sewell, a native of Selma, inspired to become the first black woman to represent the state of Alabama in Congress ever. And she says she credited so much of that to watching this, this man in the lore of what he was able to do. She was three months old when that march took place, and yet it is part of her family lore. Um, and what he was able to do on Capitol Hill, as Nancy has described, as I'm sure you know during your days on Capitol Hill, Nora, that, that he was a mentor who guided people younger than him, but certainly even some of his colleagues 
from both sides of the aisle. And, and that is truly his legacy, his ability to reach out, reach in, and connect. And certainly nonviolently, but effectively. So beautifully said, Michelle, and, and you mentioned Troy, um, Alabama, where he was from, his desire to go to um, Troy State College. You know, not that he wasn't denied, he never even heard back from them. And of course, it was an all white right. school. Yeah, and that it was an all white school. And his, yes. that was what drove him, his dilemma uh, about, and that's why he wrote to Martin Luther King Jr. And then when, when MLK Jr. sent him that trip to come meet him to Montgomery, he was met there by a young lawyer named Fred Gray, who had represented Rosa Parks. And yes. this history, and then, as has as detailed in the story, of course, uh, in the documentary Good Trouble as well, the decision about whether they would begin this landmark case to sue, you know, which was one way of resistance, of, of using the courts, and yet his family was so concerned about not only his safety, but their own. And, and Nora, I should mention his family, um, his mother and father were very concerned about him going off to Montgomery, Alabama. You know, he was just 17, 18 years old at the time. They told him, don't, don't get into any trouble and, and were concerned when he was arrested. You know, his mark of arrest were, were, were legendary 45 times by the end of his life, five times as a congressman, a sitting congressman. And yet that was, that was something that was a shame brought on the family in the 1960s. And, and there was somewhat of a distance in, in, in his family being very um, concerned at the direction of his life. So when, when his brothers and sisters spoke of, of uh, those times and how different he was, it, it was being disobedient to two of the people that he respected the most in his life. The cause trumped his family. Mm -hmm. but the a, conviction as well. Mm -hmm. And a commitment to nonviolence, as you know. And, and that quote of his is actually in the program that um, many of these members of Congress that we see here are waiting in the rotunda. It's a small program, three pages, but the last page has a picture of, of Congressman John Lewis with that phrase, when you see something that is not right, not fair, not just, you have to stand up, speak up, speak out, and find a way to get in the way and get in trouble, good trouble, good necessary, trouble. necessary trouble. I, it doesn't do it justice, me reading it, because his voice, of course, was so powerful and so uh, moving to hear him when you hear him utter that quote. Uh, it gives you goosebumps. And there, of course, many of the members of Congress waiting to receive the casket with John Lewis and the program that is set to begin. It's our understanding, too, um, in addition to the lawmakers that are there today and will speak, um, that Democratic presidential nominee Joe Biden also plans to pay his respects today. And we're told that the Vice President of the United States, Mike Pence, also later tonight with his wife, Karen, plans to pay their respects. Nancy Cordes is on the east front of the Capitol to bring us up to date on what we're seeing there. Nancy? Well, Nora, the, uh, the body of John Lewis is still inside the hearse. We still see the honor guard waiting to carry the casket up the east front steps of the Capitol where the House Sergeant at Arms is waiting to greet it. It will be brought into the rotunda where, as you mentioned, those lawmakers, those dignitaries are waiting to honor him. Uh, typically, at a ceremony like this, you would expect to see the President of the United States. In this case, President Trump is not expected to be here today. He is attending an event in North Carolina. And the President and John Lewis have had a pretty complicated relationship over the years. Uh, John Lewis boycotted 
President Trump's inauguration. He said that he felt that uh, Trump was an illegitimate president, and that decision by John Lewis, uh, who has such an impact in his caucus, inspired other Democrats to do the same. And that really angered President Trump, who tweeted that Lewis was all talk, 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 and no action, which, uh, when you know anything about the story of John Lewis's life is is pretty uh, is a pretty unbelievable statement. He also argued that uh, Lewis's district in Georgia was crime infested and that he should focus on that. The president saying something similar a couple of years ago about the district represented by Elijah Cummings in Maryland, two late African American lawmakers. Uh, the president did put out a tweet when Lewis died last week, calling him a civil rights hero, ordering that the flags at the White House be dropped to half staff. But he will not be here today, Nora. Nancy Cordes, thank you. Want to bring back in New York Times columnist Jamal Bowie and CBS News contributor. And Jamal, that tension that still exists. Um, that political tension between the president and John Lewis. And just as we are in the midst of an election year, I'm struck by what the majority whip James Clyburn said earlier today in an interview on CNN. He said we should dedicate this election year to John Lewis. What do you make of where that stands now? Uh I think so. It's it's no secret that President Trump has uh, been quite disdainful, not just of uh, Congressman Lewis, but was is very disdainful of the Black Lives Matter movement. Um, has spent his time in office. Uh, I think you can fairly say stirring up uh, um, uh, racial resentment, uh, oh. racial anger, and so. Given that background, I don't think Congressman Clyburn is wrong. Um, mm -hmm. When he says that, I think yeah. I think that the the election this year um, very much represents a contest between the president's vision of the country, a contrast between the president's vision of the country and John Lewis's vision of the co co vision of the country, which is a much more, I think, expansive and inclusive vision than the one the president has. Um, Jamel, I want to pause just for a moment because. We may have just witnessed um, a member of the Honor Guard um, just, it looks like, fainted. It's so hot in Washington, um, as, as Nancy Cordes had mentioned earlier. I was thinking about the members of the Honor Guard, too, when we were watching them at Joint Base Andrews. It's so hot when you're on a tarmac, certainly. And they're, of course, in their full dress blues, um, their formal gear, and, um, and now uh, it appears that one of them may have fainted due to the heat. So um, this may delay a bit of the procession at this moment, and certainly we wish him well. And this is one of the concerns about the heat on a day like today and people applauding. Um, very, very hot indeed, and I hope that he is Okay. And Nancy Cordes is, is right there. And uh, Nancy, what did you see? I saw him, Nora, fall to the ground. Um, and he was lying there, not moving for a couple of minutes. Immediately, we saw members of law enforcement come to his aid. We saw the other members of the military honor guard move to the side a couple of feet. And then, um, such good news, he was able to get up on his own. Looks like a member of the U.S. Navy, and he has just been escorted away. But yes, as you pointed out, it is an incredibly hot day out here, uh, even hotter here on the east front of the U.S. Capitol, um, with all this, this brick and concrete. The sun just reflects off of it. Uh, we're lucky enough to be covered by uh, an umbrella to shield us from the sun, and, and we have fans here. But uh, these members of the Honor Guard in full dress, they don't have uh, that same opportunity. And now we see the rest of them coming to the hearse to escort the casket up the steps of the east cap front of the Capitol. Let's take a moment to listen in.
Mike's dead. Fuck.
And there you see the inside of the Capitol Rotunda. And that is the Lincoln Catafalque, which was constructed after uh, the assassination of President Abraham Lincoln to hold the casket. It is used to this day. And there it sits at the center of the Rotunda with members of Congress socially distanced all wearing masks as the ceremony is set to begin to honor a man who served 17 terms, more than 30 years in the U.S. Congress, elected in 1986. Nancy Cordes is our chief congressional correspondent. And Nancy, I understand we will hear first from the Speaker of the House, Nancy Pelosi. That's right, Speaker Pelosi, who, along with working alongside John Lewis, being colleagues for 33 years, was also a close friend of his and has spoken very movingly this week about their relationship and, and about how much she learned from him, what an ally he was, the kind of moral clarity that he lent to every debate. So she's going to speak about her colleague and friend, John Lewis. We will then hear from Mitch McConnell, the majority leader of the U.S. Senate. Uh, we will hear Amazing Grace sung there inside the Capitol Rotunda. And Nora, it, what really struck me uh, when, when we saw that shot of the rotunda from above, we've never seen a site quite like this. All these chairs right there, uh, socially distanced from one another because of the coronavirus, creating really a, a, a quite a moving site there in the Capitol Rotunda. Um, people not able to sit close to one another as they normally would. Uh, the room, this magnificent hall in the middle of the U.S. Capitol, not able to hold as many lawmakers as it normally would because of the pandemic we are dealing with right now and a reminder that because the U.S. Capitol has been closed to the public since March, members of the public will not be able to process through the rotunda afterwards to pay their respects. They'll have to say goodbye from outside. And this special ceremony to honor and pay tribute to John Lewis in the U.S. Capitol Rotunda is about to begin. Let's listen in.
Ladies and gentlemen, the Honorable Nancy Pelosi, Speaker of the United States House of Representatives. Good afternoon. It is an official, personal, and very sad honor to welcome our colleague, John Lewis, back to the Capitol to welcome his family and his many friends to acknowledge his sacred life. Please stay standing for the invocation by Doc, Reverend Dr. Granger Browning, Jr., Ebenezer AME Church. Let us bow our heads in a word of prayer. Eternal God, our Father, I come before you today in the name of Jesus, thanking you for the many different faiths and beliefs and religions that make up your beloved community that come to celebrate the life and the legacy of John Lewis. We come today thanking you for the faith foundations that his mother and father established in Troy, Alabama. We thank you for his leadership of SNCC and the March in Washington. We thank you for how he was bloodied for us, bruised for us, he marched for us, sat in for us, and was willing to give up his life that we might have life, liberty, and the pursuit of happiness. And on today, as his colleagues and friends and especially family members come as he lays in state in this hallowed rotunda, we come on this day recommitting ourselves to march as he marched to ballot boxes and to this year for mailboxes and for voting rights and for civil rights and for human rights. And we'll keep doing that until that day justice rolls down like mighty waters and righteousness like a mighty stream. And finally, on July 17th, we want to say thank you that he crossed another bridge, not the Edmund Pettus Bridge that we pray that one day will be named the John Lewis Memorial Bridge, but the bridge from earth to glory. And when he got there, Elijah Cummings and the congressional a cloud of witnesses welcomed him home. As they marched down that street paved of gold, we want to say thank you from Emmett Till uh, to George Floyd, said thank you for allowing our deaths not to be in vain. And when he got to the lily white throne, we want to say thank you. He heard you say, well done, thy good and faithful servant. You have done the good fight and you have a uh, kept your eyes on the prize, and now enter into the joy of the Lord. And after you said that, Gabriel told the angels to lift every voice and sing. And we heard Dr. King in the background saying, free at last, free at last. The consciousness of Congress is free at last. In Jesus' name we pray, amen. Gentlemen, the Honorable Mitch McConnell, Majority Leader of the United States Senate, Please be seated. In his memoirs, John Lewis described a childhood home that was quite different from the place he lies today. That farmhouse in Pike County, Alabama, had no running water or electricity. It stood on the first land his father's family had ever owned in a part of the country where segregation had led to almost total isolation along racial lines. It would have been hard to conceive back then that the young child tending his family's chickens would, by age 23, 
be leading the movement to redeem American society. That he'd be addressing hundreds of thousands of civil rights marchers from the steps of the Lincoln Memorial. I was lucky enough to be there that day. I marveled at the massive crowds. The sight gave me hope for our country. That was John's doing. Even on that day, as his voice echoed across the mall, I wonder how many dared imagine that young man would come to walk the halls of the Congress. America's original sin of slavery was allowed to fester for far too long. It left a long wake of pain, violence, and brokenness that has taken great efforts from great heroes to address. John's friend, Dr. Martin Luther King Jr. famously said, the arc of the moral universe is long, but it bends toward justice. But that is never automatic. History only bent toward what's right because people like John paid the price to help bend it. He paid that price at every Nashville lunch counter where his leadership made segregation impossible to ignore. He paid it in every jail cell where he waited out hatred and oppression. He paid that price in harassment and beatings from a bus station in South Carolina to the Edmund Pettus Bridge. John Lewis lived and worked with urgency because the task was urgent. But even though the world around him gave him every cause for bitterness, he stubbornly treated everyone with respect and love. All so that, as his friend Dr. King once put it, we could build a community at peace with itself. Today, we pray and trust that this peacemaker himself now rests in peace. All of John's colleagues stand with his son, John Miles, their family, and the entire country in thanking God that he gave our nation this hero it needed so badly. May all of us that he will leave behind under this dome pray for a fraction of John's strength to keep bending that arc on toward justice. Ladies and gentlemen, the Honorable Nancy Pelosi, Speaker of the United States House of Representatives. To the family of John Lewis, welcome to the Rotunda. Under the dome of the U.S. Capitol, we have bid farewell to some of the greatest Americans in our history. It is fitting that John Lewis joins this pa pantheon of patriots resting upon the same catafalque of President Abraham Lincoln. John revered President Lincoln. His identification with Lincoln was clear 57 years ago at the shadow of the Lincoln Memorial where John declared, our minds, souls, and hearts cannot rest until freedom and justice ex exist for all people. Words that ring true today. Mr. Leader, I too was there that day. Our student years. Between then and now, John Lewis became a titan of the civil rights movement and then the conscience of the Congress. Here in Congress, John was revered and beloved on both sides of the aisle, on both sides of the Capitol. We knew that he always worked on the side of the angels, and now we know that he is with them. And we are comforted to know that he is with his beloved Lillian. It may be a comfort to John's son, John Miles, and the entire Lewis family, Michael Collins, the entire staff, that so many mourn their loss and are praying for them at this sad time. God truly blessed America <clears throat> with the life and leadership of John Lewis. We thank you for sharing him with us. May he rest in peace. John Lewis often spoke of a beloved community, a vision that he shared with the Reverend Dr. Martin Luther King, Jr., 
of the community connected and uplifted by faith, hope, and charity. And indeed, John had deep faith, believing that every person has a spark of divinity, making them worthy of respect. And he had faith in the charity of others, which is what gave him so much hope. And he read, as he wrote in his book, release the need to hate, to harbor division, and the enticement of revenge. Release all bitterness. Hold only love, only peace in your heart knowing the battle for good to overcome evil is already won. John the Optimist. Through it all, John was a person of greatness. He also was a person of great humility, always giving credit to others in the movement. John committed his life to advancing justice and understood that to build a, a better future, we had to acknowledge the past. Exactly one year ago, it was a privilege to be with John and members of the Congressional Black Caucus, Madam Chair, Karen Bass, to, to, on a pilgrimage to Ghana to observe 400 years since the arrival of the first slaves from Africa. Some of the descendants of those slaves would build this capital where John Nye lies in state on the Lincoln catafalque. I wish you could have seen the uh, response that John received when he was introduced to the Ghana parliament. My colleagues are shaking their heads. It was overwhelmingly, overwhelming. But I wish you could have seen him at the door of no return, which enslaved people were sent through onto the uh, death ships to cross the Atlantic. I wish you could have seen what it meant to him. He knew that the door of no return was a central part of American history, just as was the, is the Edmund Pettus Bridge, the March on Washington, the Selma March to Montgomery Arm. When John made his speech 57 years ago, he was the youngest speaker at the March on Washington program. How fitting it is that in the final days of his life, he summoned the strength to acknowledge the young people peacefully protesting and in the same spirit of that march, taking up the unfinished work of racial justice, helping complete the journey begun more than 55 years ago. We have all seen the photographs of John being brutally beaten in Selma, which painted an iconic picture of injustice. What a beautiful contrast to see John and the mayor of Washington who's with us today at the Black Lives Matter Plaza, standing in solidarity with the protesters, an iconic picture of justice that will endure and will inspire our nation for years to come. John firmly focused on the future, on how to inspire the next generation to join the fight for justice, and his quote, to find a way to get in the way. As one of the youngest leaders of the Freedom Rides, March on Washington, as I said, and March to Montgomery, he understood the power of young people to change the future. When asked what someone can do who is 19 or 20 years old, the age that he was when he set out to desegregate Nashville, Lewis replied, a young person should be speaking out for what is fair, what is just, what is right. Speak out for those who have been left out and left behind. That is how the movement goes forward, John said. Imagine the great joy he had traveling the country to share that message of action with young people. No need to imagine. It is my personal privilege right now for me to yield to our beloved colleague, the distinguished gentleman from Georgia, Congressman John Lewis. I grew up in rural Alabama, 50 miles from Montgomery, outside of a little place called Troy. My father was a sharecropper, a tenant farmer. But back in 1944, when I was only four years old, my father had saved $300. And with the $300, he bought 110 acres of land. My family's still on that land today. How many of you remember when you were four? <laughs> Now, what happened to the rest of us? It was many, many years ago when we would visit the little town of Troy, visit Montgomery, 
visit Tuskegee, visit Birmingham, I saw those signs that said white men, colored men, white women, colored women, white waiting, colored waiting. I would come home and ask my mother, my father, my grandparents, my great-grandparents, why? They would say, that's the way it is. Don't get in the way, don't get in trouble. But one day in 1955, 15 years old, in the 10th grade, I heard about Rosa Parks. I heard the words of Martin Luther King Jr. on our radio. 1957, I met Rosa Parks at the age of 17. In 1958, at the age of 18, I met Martin Luther King Jr. And these two individuals inspired me to get in the way, to get in trouble. So I come here to say to you this morning, on this beautiful campus, with your great education, you must find a way to get in the way. You must find a way to get in trouble, good trouble, necessary trouble. <laughs> Use your education. You have wonderful teachers, wonderful pe professors, researchers. Use what you have, use your learning, use your tools to help make our country and make our world a better place where no one would be left out or left behind. You can do it and you must do it. It is your time. In a few short days, we will commemorate what we call the Mississippi Summer Project. But more than a thousand students from all over America, many from abroad, made a trip to Mississippi to encourage people to register to vote. And the summer night of June 21st, 1964, three young men that I knew, two whites and one African American, Mickey Swerner. Andy Goodman and James Cheney went out to investigate the burning of an African-American church that was used for voter registration workshop. These three young men were detained by the sheriff, taken to jail, taken out of jail, turned over to the Klan, where they were beaten, and shot, and killed. And I tell students today, these three young men didn't die in Vietnam. They didn't die in the Middle East or Eastern Europe. They didn't die in Africa or Central or South America. They died right here in our own country, trying to help all of our citizens become participants in the democratic process. As young people, you must understand that there are forces that want to take us back to another period. But you must say that we're not going back. We made too much progress and we're going forward. There may be some setbacks, some delays, some disappointment, but you must never, ever give up or give in. You must keep the faith and keep your eyes on the prize. That is your calling. That is your mission. That is your moral obligation. That is your mandate. Get out there and do it. Get in the way. In the final analysis, we all must learn to live together as brothers and sisters. We all live in the same house. And it doesn't matter whether we are black or white, Latino, Asian American, or Native American. It doesn't matter whether we are straight or gay. We are one people, we are one family. We all live in the same house. Be bold. Be courageous. Stand up, speak up, speak up, and find a way to create the beloved community, the beloved world, a world of peace, a world that recognizes the dignity of all humankind. Never become bitter, never become hostile, never hate. Live in peace, we are one.
one people, and one love. Thank you very much. Ladies and gentlemen, Dr. Whitley Phipps.
Ladies and gentlemen, Dr. Whitney Phipps.
and peace like a river attendeth my way when sorrows like sea God grant me the serenity to accept the things I cannot change, courage to change the things I can, and wisdom to know the difference, living one day at a time, accepting hardships as a pathway to peace.
taking as he did the sinful world as it is, not as I would have it. Trusting that he will make all things right if I surrender to his will, that I may be reasonably happy in this life and supremely happy with him forever in the next. Amen. Ladies and gentlemen, please remain in your seats until you are escorted to pay your respects by the Sergeant at Arms. Congressman John Lewis's son paying his final respects there in the U.S. Rotunda, Capitol Rotunda. Members of John Lewis's family paying their respects. John Lewis was one of 10 children from Troy, Alabama, his parents sharecroppers. Want to bring in Nancy Cordes on Capitol Hill and beautiful ceremony to honor John Lewis, who now will lie in state for the next two days. Nancy. A really beautiful ceremony, Nora, and such a moving choice to have those lawmakers, other dignitaries, hear the recorded words of John Lewis himself, a reminder of what a stirring orator he was. Um, earlier this week, Hank Johnson, his fellow congressman from Georgia, described his voice, his speaking style to me this way. He said, you couldn't help but to listen to him because it would rattle your soul. He was such a powerful man, and yet the message that he spoke, just simple, not highfalutin words, just speaking so that even a child could understand his message. He had a very special way of communicating. It's a reason why he found himself in the pages of history by the time he was a very young man. It's the reason that he was so impactful on Capitol Hill, one of many reasons anyway. Uh, but one of the things that gave him such great power and stature was that speaking style uh, that really had such an impact on the people around him, both those that agreed with him and those who didn't. And that launched him onto the national stage as a 23-year-old in the March on Washington. Nancy Cordes, our chief congressional correspondent, thank you. And tonight and tomorrow, Lewis will lie in state in the Capitol Rotunda before making one final trip back home to Georgia, his final resting place. And on Thursday, we'll bring you full coverage of a celebration of life ceremony for Lewis at Atlanta's Ebenezer Baptist Church, once led by his mentor, Dr. Martin Luther King, Jr. Our coverage will continue on our 24-hour streaming network, CBSN, and you can watch it at cbsnews.com or on our CBS News app. There will be more on your local news on this CBS station, and we will have a full wrap-up for you tonight on the CBS Evening News. This has been a CBS News special report in honor of Congressman John Lewis. I'm Nora O'Donnell, CBS News, Washington.
You've been watching CBS's special report as people have been paying their respects to Congressman John Lewis laying in state at the U.S. Capitol. We will continue our coverage of his extraordinary life and legacy, as well as the rest of the day's news after a break, so stick with us. You're streaming CBSN, CBS News, always on. Go to the ends of the earth. Right now. We got something crazy. Oh, boom. And reach for the stars. Here we are. <laughs> Tom. Yes, it's my comeback. <laughs> hey, this is pretty fun. But wait, there's more. Experience thought-provoking. Multiple to the idea of being a human being. Innovative da, 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 da. and truly original That's reporting. Cool. Look through a telescope and go, wow. Because there's always something new under the sun on CBS Sunday morning. COVID has taken the lives of tens of thousands of Americans. Rural areas like this here on Navajo Nation are especially hit hard. 15 to 30 percent of our Navajo citizens don't have running water. In any indigenous reservation, there is a shortage of physicians. Native Americans are amongst the most vulnerable and hardest hit by COVID. Yeah, the more we lose our elders to COVID-19, the more we lose our language and our way of life. We need to bring awareness to the attention of Washington, D.C. and United States citizens that there is a need to focus on the first citizens of this country. In 60 years, we went from about 100,000 factory workers to probably about 7,000. Off in the distance, you can see some factories that are still humming, but most of them are just kind of abandoned. The restaurant industry right now is one of the largest and fastest growing industries in America. And yet it continues to be the absolute lowest paying employer in the United States. Barely anybody's making enough to live. You're donating plasma to get by. Uh -huh. It's literally a slave wage. I don't remember growing up like this. My mom didn't have to go to food banks. It's pretty sad. Even really young kids are feeling what's going on right now. How should parents be talking to them about this whole question of racial justice? How do we embrace this moment and turn it into real change? What we really must focus on is moving from protesting to policy. Join Gail, Anthony, and Tony on CBS This Morning. CBSN Los Angeles. Get local news, breaking news, anytime, anywhere. It's easy to find us, and it's free. Download the CBS News app on your favorite devices. CBSN Los Angeles, streaming 24-7. You can watch CBSN 24-7. I've got an amazing story to share with you. I understand you have some breaking news. How does it all play out? It's quite an adventure here at CBSN. It's been a day. Doctors and scientists in a race against time to cure coronavirus will show just how close they are racing to a cure on the CBS Evening News with Nora O'Donnell. Tributes continue to pour in for television icon Regis Philbin. Philbin is most well known for co-hosting Live with Regis and Kathy Lee and later Live with Regis and Kelly. He also hosted the popular primetime game show, Who Wants to Be a Millionaire? Regis launched his career in the 1950s on The Joey Bishop Show and holds the Guinness World Record for most hours on television. His family said the TV personality died Friday of natural causes. He was 88 years old. Actress Olivia de Havilland is being remembered for her seven decades long career. She's best known for her role as Melanie Hamilton in the 1939 film Gone with the Wind, which has been criticized in recent years for its portrayal of slavery and the antebellum South. De Havilland won Oscars for her acting in To Each His Own and The, ha the Heiress in the 1940s. She died at her home in Paris Sunday at 104 years old. 
The WNBA season kicked off Saturday with a statement against racial injustice. Players from the New York Liberty and Seattle Storm left the court during the national anthem as a sign of peaceful protest. The teams then held a moment of silence for 26 seconds to represent Breonna Taylor's age. She was a Louisville EMT who was shot and killed by police in her own home while sleeping. Earlier this month, the league announced that the 2020 season will be dedicated to raising awareness about social justice issues. And on the men's side, the voting rights group founded by NBA star LeBron James and other black athletes and entertainers is committed to donate $100,000 to help former felons in Florida seeking to vote in the November election. LeBron's More Than a Vote initiative is expected to pay off outstanding fees and fines associated with those felony convictions. In a tweet last week, he said, quote, this is a fight about their constitutional right to vote being denied. LeBron, who moved to the Los Angeles Lakers in 2018, spent four seasons with the Miami Heat, bringing in two NBA championships to South Florida. And coming up in our next hour, cases of the coronavirus continue to surge across the country as extra jobless benefits expire for tens of millions of Americans. Plus, as Texas deals with soaring cases of the coronavirus, the region is hit by a hurricane. How the pandemic is complicating efforts to keep people safe. And countdown to November with just 99 days until the election. How the race is shaping up this far out. Plus, we'll have results of a new CBS News Battleground tracker poll. You're streaming CBSN always on. Go to the ends of the earth. Right now. We got something crazy.